Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana, and I'm a member of the education team here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, coming to you live from Long Beach, California. Now, if you're new to our Online Academy, I want to say welcome. Uh, this is a really great opportunity for you to learn a little bit about our ocean habitat, as well as to interact with us. Uh, while staying safe at home. And then uh, the way we can do that is throughout this programming, we actually have a phone number right down here that allows you to text in and ask me questions. That phone number is 562-286-1838. And if you've been watching for months or weeks or even just all of today, uh, you know the drill. Welcome back. We're excited to have you all joining us this afternoon for our last program of the day. We're going to be exploring all about bioluminescence and the deep see. And we're going to do that um, kind of by following a little path. We're going to start out about um, what we know about the deep sea, right? What, what does that habitat look like? Then we're going to talk about what we know that animals need. What do animals need to survive? And then we're going to kind of relate what the needs are versus how they might kind of find them in that habitat by using bioluminescence or light. And so we're going to kind of move through that pathway and explore. I like to go off on tangents, right? Who said a road trip is a one way from point A to point B? Um, so we might jump off on other topics and explore things. I really like to cater my class towards whatever you are interested in learning about. And so um, go ahead and shoot us a text. Once again, it's 562 286 one now, Kaya here is going to put a, a picture on, on the screen behind me, and it's going to show what our habitat in the deep sea might look like. All right, so what do you see down here? Is there a whole lot of anything? Not really, huh? So our deep sea habitat, um, there's a lot that we still have to discover. But um, as far as what we do know, we know that it's really vast. And there's not a lot, right? There's not a lot down there. Um, however, the more we learn, the more we discover, we realize that there, um, there are sea mounts and there actually are deep sea corals and there are deep sea habitats uh, that animals kind of congregate around. But for the most part, our ocean is deep, deep depths. In fact, we've only explored about 5% of our ocean seafloor before. And so um, a lot of it, that has been really coastal uh, coastal ocean and so the deep sea kind of covers the majority of it and there's still so much left to discover but let's take a look at another photograph or even video clip of what we've got down there and see if we can kind of um, get our, our wheels turning in our mind and see um, if we identify anything if there's anything we can think of of what it's like in the deep sea in fact I'm talking the most exciting part of this video so that right there was an ROV or a remote operated vehicle and it's what allows us to get this footage right here it's um, I like to think of it as a real-life video game in the sense that someone is controlling this from a boat and they are controlling it using joy cons and using buttons the same way you might control a video game and it's down here getting all of this amazing footage now look there was an animal in that last picture and actually if we pause it that could be cool let's pause it here do you see any animals on this screen we're gonna get there <laughs> there we go so this right here that actually looks really similar to something that we have here in our shallow waters it looks like a tuna crab now it's not but I would imagine, just given the appearance, that maybe it's related, right? So it's definitely an arthropod or a jointed legged invertebrate. What else can we discover in this photo here or, or in this video clip? Hmm. Now you might notice that there's like vases and... Um, ooh, actually, can you pause it right here? This is great. So do you see these two red dots on the bottom of the screen? Now that's not lasers coming out of the depths of the ocean. <laughs> what that is, is that is two little laser points on the ROV, on that remotely operated vehicle I was talking about. And this is what allows scientists to get like a size comparison. They know that those two dots are six inches apart or whatever they set the time, uh, the size scale to. So that's just a visual for people watching the video to get like, a, it's like a banana for scale kind of thing, right? All right, so what else can we see here? So this is a great overview. Um, I think what I was starting to say, though, is that there's a lot of things that are showing up, like vases or bottles or human objects that seem a little bit out of place. Now, I believe what we're looking at is actually possibly um, like a shipwreck site. So you can see a lot going on here where things 
um, are kind of scattered across the seafloor. But I mentioned how there are habitats that animals and organisms tend to congregate around. Artificial reefs like a sea uh, or like a shipwreck can be one of those habitats. So while the open ocean is mostly empty, there are spaces like this um, where animals tend to aggregate. So there's a lot going on here. There's one of those vases or bottles I was talking about, right? Um, and so what are some observations that we can make or some, some inferences that we can make that we know about the deep sea? Hmm. Okay, well, the only reason we can see anything right now is because there's flashlights, right? We have lights on the ROV. It's like the headlights of a car. Um, Kaya, do we have a photo of what it looks like in the deep sea without the lights on? All right, so we're going to see that here in just one moment. So this is what it looks like with, a f with lights. All right, and we'll jump over there. Aha! This is what it looks like without lights, right? It's really dark. I'm having a hard time seeing, okay? So this is the deep sea. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> All right, so you get the idea, right? Without lights, it's very, very dark down there. Um, what else can we, can we infer or do we know about the deep sea? Um, like I said earlier, we saw that it's very vast looking at that open space. We saw some hills and some mountains and valleys right in here, which like we forget that those exist down there, right? Um, we discovered all of this through looking at maps of our seafloor using sonar. We actually have a really great clip that'll show you how we did that. Um, so again, we're kind of recapping how we do know things about the deep ocean. So we'll pull that clip up here um, in just a moment. All right, beautiful. Okay, so these colors, it's kind of confusing. It's not just a rainbow to look pretty, um, but the colors represent depth. So the reds and oranges and yellows, those are shallower, and then the blue tends to be much darker. Here's another example of that vastness, right? Not a whole lot going on, but look, organisms, okay? So, ooh, another organism. In fact, we recognize this. That's a crab, right? Um, and so that was just an example of how we might get that map and what, how we know what it looks like. Um, so, so far, we've got that it's really dark, uh, we've got that as vast. It's huge, right? It's 95% of the, uh, the ocean's seafloor. Um, what else do we know about the deep ocean? What do you think? <sighs> right. It's really cold, right? So um, there's a very high pressure down there. And there's not a lot of light, and it can be a very cold environment. In fact, I kind of just gave it away. It's also a really high pressure environment. There's a lot of weight of water at the bottom of the seafloor. Um, so this is kind of what we know about it. It's deep, it's big, there's a lot of pressure, it's cold, and it's very dark, right? So now we're going to take a different approach, and we're going to be looking at what animals need to survive. Not in the deep sea, just in general. What do animals need in life, all right? Um, so let's maybe go to a webcam or um, a habitat that's closer to shore that we might recognize, and think about the animals that are calling it home. Think about what these animals might need to survive. So what do you think? So not this habitat, but an up and coming one. So animals need to survive. Well, what do you and I need to survive? Hmm. Okay, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Let's make some observations. What do these sharks need? Now, some of you might be saying, well, sharks need to move, right? Or sharks need to get an up close shot of the camera every now and then, right? That's how they keep their celebrity status. Um, some people might say that sharks, ah, Bella's chiming in. Thanks for joining us again, Bella. Um, sharks need food. Yes, absolutely. And it's not just sharks that need food, but animals need food, right? That's kind of their, uh, one of their life sustaining. Okay. Another guess that we get a lot is shelter, right? And shelter is important, but there are also a lot of animals that don't live in habitats with uh, sh a place that we'd consider shelter, like open ocean animals, right? Um, or even this animal, it doesn't really look like it has a whole lot of shelter. And this is great. This is a deep sea animal we can chat about in a little bit. Um, so food, what else? If you're thinking reproduction or finding a mate, 
you're right. Sometimes at first it's like, well, do animals need that? But no, that's the goal of the animal kingdom is to pass on your genes, right? So animals need to find a, a, a way to find a mate. That means they have to wait, find a way to communicate or they have to find, find people or beings, right? Not people, but other organisms of their kind. Um, and then, so we have food, we have a mate. What else? What else does an animal need to be able to do in order to survive? Hmm. If you were a fish right now, swimming in a shark tank, what do you think you would be doing? Yeah, you're a little fish. You're a prey item, right? So animals need to find a way to not be prey, right? And so find food, find a mate, and avoid becoming food. So those are all easy things for us to think about when we think of like uh, a coral reef habitat because we've we've explored so much of it or a kelp forest habitat we explored that in our last program as well uh, but what about in the deep sea how do animals do that and that's going to roll us into our bioluminescence talk okay so i'm going to kind of give the reins over to kaya she's going to throw some items up on the screen behind us Oh, and we're going to talk about these animals and how they might use light of any kind or bioluminescence or also biofluorescence, which we'll talk about as well, and how they're able to find food, find a mate, or avoid becoming food, right? The three kind of big ones. So, oh, this is beautiful. This is an example of a bunch of deep sea creatures. That's weird looking. So is that. So is that. So is that. You might notice that deep sea animals are very, very different looking because they're in this habitat that we really don't have anything else to compare it to. In all of our online programming, we've all been talking about adaptations, how an animal is um, adapted or, or built, I should say, to survive in its specific habitat. And oftentimes, you know, fish have fins, they move around through water, they have gills, they breathe underwater. Um, but it can be that fish are very colorful to blend into their coral reef habitat, or birds have feathers that helps them fly and wings, right, that lift them. Um, and these are things that animals have, but they're also things that we understand. In the deep sea, adaptations can look very, very different because it's unlike any other habitat that we know on Earth. Um, and so we have a question. Bella's asking, how can animals survive in such cold water? Well, that's a great question, Bella. That's going to lead into the adaptations, right? So um, I don't know how any of those animals survive, but I do know that there are some fish in the deep sea that are living in that really cold habitat that actually have something in their body that's similar to antifreeze. It's a protein in their body. So a fish just like this, it's a protein in their body that keeps their blood from freezing at such a cold temperature, um, which is really amazing, right? Because that's an adaptation that would be weird to find in a human, right? We put them in our cars. We fill our cars with antifreeze to make sure that if we live in a, a really cold, um, cold region on Earth that it doesn't freeze. But it's something that an animal has in its body, which is great. Now, another thing that they're going to have to do... Um, is deal with, like I said, they're dealing with the food, the mate, and um, avoiding becoming food. And I want to really focus on the bioluminescence and fluorescence. So let's throw flower hat jelly back up on the screen here. Um, so when we talk about bioluminescence and biofluorescence, they are two different things. Luminescence is a chemical reaction between two, um, two bacteria, uh, chemicals, um, <laughs> spaced on that one, and it's between luciferid and luciferase. And when those two components interact, it creates this light. Now, oftentimes that light is blue. So I actually think we might have that picture from the bioluminescence that was here off of our coastline recently that we can show you. Um, so if you are local to Southern California, if you recall during our stay at home order, um, we actually had an amazing phenomenon going on off of our coast with bioluminescent diatoms. Now, diatoms, um, or were they dinoflagellates? They, I believe they were dinoflagellates. Um, they are a type of plankton that can, that, that, here we go, that bioluminesce when they're disturbed. So um, it's those two chemicals interacting, luciferin and luciferase, and they create light. Now, biofluorescence is very different. This is a biofluorescent fish. Great photo. Thank you, Kaya. So biofluorescence is not the creation of light, but instead the reflection of light um, in the sense that if this was just dark, it would be dark. 
but because we shine a light on it, usually a blue light or like a black light, um, it can it can ref it can reflect or refract. Okay, reflect that light in a different wave, and it allows us to see this kind of green fluorescent color. Um, so very different. You can see between the blue bioluminescence and usually typically greenish kind of biofluorescence. One is creating light, and one is reflecting light that is applied to it. So how do animals in the deep sea use it? We've been talking a lot about light. <laughs> now, animals in the deep sea like this, this is one, um, this is a type of coral. And so you can see that under different light, it looks a very, very different. Now, um, first of all, we're going to look at some examples of how animals use light to attract food in a deep sea. Can you think of any exa uh, examples of animals that might use light to attract food, to attract prey? What do you think? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think you guys are onto something here. So if you were thinking of an anglerfish, we can just go to the studio. I don't think we have a photo. Um, if you're thinking of an anglerfish, you're right. So anglerfish have a tiny little doodad coming off their head. And that little doodad will light up. Now, if I'm swimming around in the deep, dark ocean, and it's pitch black, and I'm like, la, 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 there's light over there, right? I'm going to be attracted to that light. Oh, perfect. I feel like I'm in the zone now. I'm swimming around, deep, dark ocean. <gasps> There's light over there, right? And so I'm going to be drawn in towards that light. And that's going to ultimately take me right into the mouth of that predator. So animals who use light to attract prey are really intelligent in the sense that um, that was an adaptation that came to them uh, if an animal was able to get light and eat more versus the animal whose little doodad didn't glow. That animal didn't get food, so they didn't make it, right? And they weren't able to move on to the next necessity, which is passing on their genes. That part is very important for evolution. Um, it's really funny. The camera that I'm looking at right now is just glowing because I just stared at the light. <laughs> uh, but so the animal that has the glowing doodad, right, the anglerfish, they are going to be successful in capturing, in capturing prey. Whereas the anglerfish that did not have that was not able to reproduce because they weren't able to eat and live. So now reproduction. How do animals find a mate? Well, it's a really big area down there, right? There's a lot of space in the open ocean. And the odds of coming across someone that is the same species as you is actually pretty slim in a lot of places, unless you're around one of those aggregating kind of habitats like the shipwreck. Um, or actually, to go back to Bella's question about staying cold, there are really warm habitats in this deep sea as well. They're called hydrothermal vents like this, where there's um, heat coming out. And so areas like this that kind of um, aggregate uh, it's called like an ag animal aggregation area. Um, you might have more success, but if you're just cruising around in the open ocean, in the deep, deep sea, and you're trying to find a mate, you're going to have to find a way to com A, find another animal, and B, communicate with them. And using that light is another way that animals can communicate. In fact, less so on the mate side of things and more so just on strictly communication, we have fish here at the Aquarium of the Pacific called flashlight fish, and they have little packets that contain the bioluminescent um, components of luciferin and luciferase, and they flash light to communicate with each other. Now, sometimes it can just be as simple as, hey, I'm over here and you're over there and we're schooling together, right? And communication using light is very, very important. In fact, um, the bioluminescent that we had here off of our coast was another form of communication in the sense that they were lighting up when they were getting disturbed. So usually it would be in the waves or as you saw there, it was in the boat wake. Um, and when animals do that, it can be communication that they don't know what is disturbing them, but they're going to assume it's a predator. So that's their way of lighting up and being like, there's a predator right here, which kind of rotates us into our next one, which is defense, right? So, um, this is communication, but it is also a way of defense. Another reason that animals can use bioluminescence is to avoid becoming prey. So there's our third one. And uh, they do that in this sense. I like to refer to it as a burglar alarm. They light up saying, there's something eating me, hoping that something bigger will come eat that. Right? So um, it's kind of, a, like I said, a burglar alarm alerting um, 
it might light up and risk them being seen, but it's also attracting other other predators to come eat their predator. Now, my favorite animal that uses bioluminescence as a defense mechanism is actually a little shrimp. I think we have a photo of it somewhere. I'm not totally sure where, but it's a little red shrimp there, maybe. Um, and then there's actually a picture of it with the bioluminescence somewhere. While Kai is looking for that, we'll keep our eyes on this one. But the way, aha! <laughs> See? Perfect. So right here, uh, this little shrimp lives in the deep sea. And what they do is as they're cruising around, if they're chased by a predator, they have this little packet of bioluminescence right here that's slightly delayed. Now, when I say that, what I mean is that shrimp's running, it's running or swimming, I should say, and it goes and it shoots out this little packet of bioluminescence. And then the shrimp goes the other direction. And the predator, where do you think the predator is going to go? They're in a really deep, dark habitat. All they see all of a sudden is this beautiful packet of blue light. Yeah, the predator is going to chase after that light. And so it's going to allow that shrimp to kind of evade capture, right? Um, now, another thing that I just learned right before this class, which I think is very cool, uh, Sarah, who's somebody else in the studio who's helping us out today, she was saying that flashlight fish, the same ones that I just said have the little packet under their eyes, they also can use that to kind of confuse predators. Like, okay, so there's three of us. There's me, Kaya, and Sarah in here, right? And um, a predator comes after me, and Kaya flashes her lights. Now all of a sudden the predator's like, oh wait, it's over here. And then Sarah flashes hers and oh wait, it's over here. And then I flash mine. And we're able to kind of work together as a team. And that's A, communication and B, defense, right? So again, light in the deep sea is very, very, very important for animals to hit those three main life necessities of finding food, finding a mate, and avoiding becoming food, right? Or um, defense. Let's jump back to the studio here for a second. So I do have some questions. Uh, Maya wants to know, do some corals in the deep sea have bioluminescence? Yeah, Maya, great question. So I think we put this picture up before, right? So this is us shining a light on a deep sea coral. Uh, this is what it would look like if you were just like looking at it in broad daylight. But when it's dark, it does in fact bioluminesce. And so you can't get the exact same outline, right? But you can infer where those connections are just by looking at the lights that are glowing um, kind of around you. So this is a beautiful photo of it. Now, ooh, we have some biofluorescent coral as well. Let's check that out. Okay, that's cool, right? So again, this is not creating that light. Remember the difference between biofluorescence and bioluminescence. Bioluminescence is creating light. Biofluorescence, you have to shine light, uh, black light on it, and then it'll kind of return it in this beautiful green color. Um, so yeah, there are corals that can do that. In fact, a dream of mine um, is to go scuba diving at night, which I've done before. I've done a night dive, but I want to dive at night with a regular white light and then like a black light and just see the difference because there's even animals off of our coastline that biofluoresce that might surprise you. Um, Malaya wants to know, do animals have the ability to control the light? Great question. So I believe, and I might be wrong, so those of you who are helping me out here, um, feel free to chime in. Um, they can control when the, the two components come together, but they're not like controlling the light, if that makes sense. How do we feel about that answer? Yeah. Yeah. So they decide when to, to deploy it, but it's not like they're the ones that are like... Um, like, I don't want to say turning it on and off because they are kind of the ones. Some of it is also just um, a reaction. So like the, the, the glowing, um, al uh, glowing plankton, oh, or that one, um, but the plankton that we had here off of our coastline, that was due to a disturbance that causes that light to happen. You could also actually walk in the sand and see the same thing because you were disturbing that organism that had the, the bioluminescent ability. Um, so yeah, great questions, everyone. Uh, I hope you kind of were able to chime in and join me through that. I know it was a little bit of a whirlwind, but just to do a, a recap of what we discussed. So in the beginning, we were talking about the deep sea habitat. Right? We talked about the fact that um, it's very dark, it's very cold, there's not a lot around it. In fact, Kyle, let's play a couple other videos of the deep sea habitat. Um, so here's that image that we were looking at. She's going to pull up a couple other videos for us, and that'll allow us to kind of get our last idea of what it looks like. Um, 
And then from there, we thought about just animals in general, right? What do animals need? Uh, they need food, they need a mate, and they need to avoid becoming food. And then we were able to apply those concepts and learn and discover how animals did that. Now, I am not a deep sea expert, you know, if that didn't come across here. <laughs> um, but I was able to do that by looking at those tools that I use. So what I want to encourage you all to do is to do the same thing. If you go to a new habitat and you're exploring a habitat and you don't totally understand it, think about the bare necessity needs that an animal has and look around at the animals and see if you can identify the adaptations that allow them to meet those needs. So Kaya's nodding her head. It looks like she has some great video of the, the deep sea. Let's get kind of one last little cap here. Now, it might surprise people that there's debris on the bottom of the seafloor, but I want you to think harder. Does it really surprise you that there's human debris on the bottom of the seafloor? <laughs> now, some animals will actually use that and create homes out of it, especially like the glass objects tend to be a little more successful. There's those two red dots that we had talked about. Something that I find really interesting about exploring the deep sea is as much as we are able to just talk about in this last um, half hour, there's still so much to discover that almost every time you're on a deep sea excursion, you're like learning and seeing new things. So if that's something that excites you and that's something that, that gets you interested, um, I encourage you to learn a little bit more about deep sea exploration, the animals that call that habitat home, um, and even just some fun facts about the animals. Like I said, I'm very much not an expert. Every time I teach this class, I learn a new fun fact. Um, so I hope you kind of join me on that and continue to learn uh, as well. So we're going to kind of end it there and wrap it up. But again, I want to thank you those. Thank you. Uh, thank you to those of you who joined us today. We're going to wrap up our online academy this afternoon, but we will be back tomorrow morning at nine o'clock to learn about sea turtles, which is great because today is uh, World Sea Turtle Day. So um, if you want to learn more about sea turtles, we'll see you tomorrow at nine o'clock. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon, and uh, we'll hopefully see you tomorrow. Bye.